Have you ever noticed how it's an incredibly scary time to be alive? We face an impending climate disaster. The rise of artificial intelligence and automation will crush us all to dust in the great metal jaw of progress. Young people face a deep uncertainty and older people are facing a reckoning as they have to come to terms with the kind of planet that their kids and grandkids are going to inherit. But what if I told you that we can afford to take on every single one of those challenges? I want to talk to you today about an idea in economics that could fundamentally change how we work together to solve big problems. It's an idea that cuts at the heart of the systems by which we produce and distribute the things that we value. And it challenges the 18th century assumptions that are currently threatening to tear our planet apart. It's a rebuke of scarcity and fear and division. And it's backed by a growing number of forward-looking and respected economists, policymakers, and academics. It's called modern monetary theory. And while establishment politicians are clinging to outdated and failing models of public finance, modern monetary theory offers a vision of the economy that works for us all, no matter your age, your postcode, or the color of your skin. And yes, regrettably, oh, it's economics. But it might just save the world. How? Modern monetary theory takes the focus off balancing a budget and forces us to think about how we balance an economy as a whole and think about how we can use the economy to solve the great challenges that we're facing. Now, these are very big claims that I promise to come good on by the end of this very big video. But before we get to how modern monetary theory can solve problems, it's worth taking a look at how governments solve problems at the moment. I think the popular feeling is that they don't. Those challenges that we face, we know there are solutions. You can lift everyone out of poverty by expanding our social safety net. You can slash carbon emissions by directly investing in green jobs and renewables research and development. We can connect every corner of this country with affordable, sustainable high-speed rail. And we can end unemployment with a federal job guarantee. And the reply is always the same but how will you pay for it? And it's not just the conservative response either. You will hear popular mainstream progressive politicians in interview after interview moaning about the need for budget repair. They give us fumbling explanations of how we can begin to make incremental change. We increase a tax here, close a loophole over there, find efficiencies in a program here, and kick the can down the road with an 18 month review. Then and only then can we do a fraction of what's necessary to address a fraction action of a challenge. It's not good enough, not by a long shot, and it ignores the unique, mind-boggling power that governments have to make the investments that we need. So how will we pay for bold, transformative social programs? The exact same way that we pay for anything else. The exact same way that we pay for submarines and weapons and trillion dollar bailouts for the major banks and fossil fuel subsidies and border walls. The government passes legislation and in response, the Reserve Bank writes a check or credits the appropriate account using keystrokes in a computer. That's it. That's it. That's it. The government doesn't need to go and find the money anywhere. The government is the sole source of that money. They are the issuer of currency. The government is not like the rest of us. It's not a household running up debt on a credit card. It's not a small business that can go bankrupt if it spends more than it takes in. As the issuer of a currency, governments spend money into existence. It doesn't come from taxpayers. In fact, we can only pay tax once that money has been spent into circulation to begin with. And while the government may then choose to pull some of that currency out of circulation, it doesn't have to offset every dollar that it spends by finding a dollar to save elsewhere. Don't overthink this. It sounds incredibly simple, impossibly simple. One of the titans of 20th century economics, John Kenneth Galbraith has a line that I find very comforting here. He says, the process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. But don't be repelled. A government will authorize a central bank to make whatever payment it wants. They can then determine how much of that spending they want to offset and bring back in as revenue. And to be clear, this isn't a policy suggestion. I'm not suggesting a change to how governments work. This is how governments work right now. Any government that issues and controls the currency that is used in their country cannot run out of that currency. 
The US government cannot run out of US dollars. The Australian government cannot run out of Australian dollars. The New Zealand government can't run out of fake Australian dollars and so on. Now make no mistake, that doesn't mean that governments can buy absolutely anything they want in absolutely any quantity they want at absolutely any speed they want. An economy has a kind of internal speed limit. The government's special power is as a buyer and there's only so much to buy at any given time. But there are vast, unused and underutilized resources that the government can and should mobilize with spending. How many people looking for work can we give decent employment to for the benefit of all of our communities? How many researchers are stuck waiting for research grants when they could be out there in their labs doing the work that will propel humanity forward? How much food goes wasted on shelves while people who don't have the money to buy it go hungry? In each of these cases, the government can spend to achieve an important social outcome without ever exceeding the natural limits of the economy. If we overshoot those limits, we could drive up prices and cause inflation. But right now, we know that we are so far away from those limits. Inflation is low and there are millions of people who are looking for work. Business confidence is shaky and there's so much work to be done. Increasing the cost of things that ordinary people rely on to survive is a concern and it's one that should be at the forefront of any treasurer's mind when they're building a budget. But spooky national debt and deficits? Those numbers don't mean anything in isolation. They're just accounting records in a spreadsheet. It's the effect of those numbers that we should be thinking about. That's what modern monetary theory is all about the unique ability for sovereign governments to spend to solve problems. I know it feels weird. It upsets some of our most ingrained metaphors. Debt that doesn't matter? It doesn't seem to be an accurate description of how you and I relate to money. And that's because it isn't. Our relationship with money is a hell of a lot more stressful than a government's. When we spend more than we make, we have to find a way to make more money in future or tighten our belts so that we can pay it back. A government doesn't have to tighten its belt because governments don't have belts. What we call a budget deficit is just a record that the government has spent more than it's taken back in. And that can be a really good thing because targeted correctly, that spending goes straight into the hands of ordinary people in our communities. Deficits are great. They fund the sort of projects that people and businesses just can't. They put people to work. They make sure that families going through tough times can afford to put food on the table. They aren't something to be worried about. And an easy way to know this for sure is just to look at Australia's economic history. For 90 of the last 117 years, we have run budget deficits. And our deficits are always way, way bigger than the surpluses. When governments run deficits, as long as we aren't already operating at our productive capacity, it tends to grow the economy. How we spend that money and what we use that deficit for matters, of course, but that's the discussion that we should be having, not freaking out about whether or not the government has money to begin with. Because the answer is it always does. So what's the role of a tax then? If the government can already spend on these valuable, important social projects and taxation doesn't bring in or save the government any money, then why tax at all? Well, a few reasons. Taxation is an excellent way to redistribute wealth and to address the problems arising from income and wealth inequality. Don't worry, billionaires should still pay huge and meaty taxes on income and wealth. But we don't tax billionaires because we quote unquote need their money. Tax should also be used to disincentivize antisocial activity. The stuff that we know is bad for us. Corporations that make revolting profits from socially destructive activities like gambling and tobacco and fossil fuels and polluting our waterways should absolutely be taxed to the teeth. If we all broadly believe that people should be discouraged from turning a profit by intentionally making people sick and bankrupt, then that is a public attitude and popular belief that we can help realize through taxation. Again, this challenge is a really fundamental and ingrained metaphor. The taxpayer is the hero of the modern economy, right? Thatcher got a lot of mileage out of insisting that there's no such thing as public money, only taxpayer money, but literally the opposite is true. That's not how money works. As we established before, governments spend currency into existence. Literally all money is public money. There is just so much incredible potential in shifting the focus of budgets and public finance towards democratically determined real outcomes. This is a topic that I find it very easy to be very positive about, and I've been quite positive for quite a while. So let's take a break and talk about the limitations. Firstly, this won't work everywhere. It will only work in monetary sovereign nations. That is a nation that issues and controls its own currency and has a floating exchange rate. So Italy, Greece, Ireland, bad news. 
Because you answer to the European Central Bank, you can't control the supply of currency. Italy can run out of euros because it doesn't issue euros. But for nations that do issue and control their own currency, like the US, Australia and New Zealand, Significant deficit spending is a sustainable and perfectly responsible way to grow an economy and to achieve important social outcomes. Uh, point of order, you left-wing idiot. If you like spending so much, why don't you go marry it? Have you ever heard of Venezuela or Weimar Germany? Wow, that was so helpful, thank you. Which brings me to some other conditions. Venezuela isn't a monetary sovereign nation. They issue their own currency, yes, but the Venezuelan Bolivar is pegged to the value of the US dollar. That's a fixed exchange rate which means that the Venezuelan government is committed to the exchange of a certain number of Venezuelan bolivar for one US dollar. That means that they can't really maintain or control the value of their currency as they spend more of it. It's always going to be valued relative to the US dollar. Moreover, until 2017, 98% of the value of Venezuela's exports were in oil. When the price of oil collapsed, so did the value of Venezuela's exports, so did its tax base, and so did so much of the country's productive capacity. The pegging of the Venezuelan Bolivar against the US dollar and their reliance on oil as a single export means that the Venezuelan economy isn't really one where deficit spending can work. And the Weimar Republic experienced hyperinflation because they were running huge deficits at a time that their productive capacity had literally been shot to pieces. Half their labor force straight up died at the Battle of the Somme. And after the war, Germany wasn't investing in infrastructure. They were spending huge amounts of money trying to service the debts that they owed to other countries. Reparations that were paid in currencies that they didn't control. Australia, by contrast, has not recently lost World War I. The only treaty that we've recently signed in France was the Paris Climate Accord. Although from the way conservatives talk about it, you'd be forgiven for thinking that that was a war as well. No one who is serious about modern monetary theory ignores inflation. In fact, modern monetary theory places a singular focus on inflation as the one true constraint that should inform government spending. It seeks to understand what really causes inflation and what strategies we can use to mitigate it. But it's also worth pointing out that nobody fucking understands inflation anyway, least of all the cynics who say that if we invest in public schools and hospitals, we'll have to pay for bread with wheelbarrows full of cash. It's just not true that deficits cause inflation. The US government is currently running a trillion dollar deficit and there is no inflation in sight. Since the late 90s, Japan has been running huge deficits and yet their inflation has rarely cracked 1% and often it's negative. Why? because almost no economies are running at their full potential. The brainless, invisible hand of the market isn't actually that good at getting shit done. Who knew? The useful question is what kind of deficit causes inflation? And that is a question that MMT is deeply interested in. And the answer? As it depends. The final limitation that I want to recognize is that it's dishonest to say that MMT can solve every problem. In fact, no economic reform in isolation can solve every problem. As we've seen in the US, a conservative government that doesn't give a shit about surpluses is still going to run incredibly cynical fear campaigns. They will demonize First Nations people, they will demonize people of color, they will demonize queer and trans kids. That kind of hatred predates neoliberalism, and it's up to us to make sure that it doesn't outlast it. While it's true that the weight of economic injustice is disproportionately felt by marginalized communities, we will never dismantle structural hatred and prejudice while we're looking at economic inequality in isolation. This isn't a new idea. It stands on the shoulders of hugely influential economic thinkers like John Maynard Keynes, but it's been turned into a comprehensive theory through decades of work from the likes of Australia's own Professor Bill Mitchell or Stephanie Kelton in the US. Their work has been fundamental in demonstrating the radical potential that is already at our disposal to reshape society for the better. Yes, there are limitations. Yes, there are some unknown quantities. But can it really be worse than inaction in the face of catastrophic climate change? Can it be worse than the government's cruel austerity logic that leaves millions of people to languish in involuntary unemployment and die in poverty? Can it be worse than the sum of all the angst and division and conflict that arises from telling generation after generation of people at a time where there has never been so much wealth that there isn't enough to go around. I really don't think so. It is getting very late and this is to just scratch at the surface of a huge topic. But if you take one thing away from this video, let it be this. We do not need to accept it when politicians tell us that we cannot afford the solutions to problems and that ordinary people can't have nice things. It simply is not true. And progressives need to develop the economic vocabulary to fight back when we hear it. 
we do not need to accept the vision of society and the economy that is pushed on us from the top down by a joint political and billionaire class that already has everything. We don't need to beg for charity from financiers and bankers. We don't need to scrap for crumbs from the tables of billionaires. We can put aside the brainless and bankrupt market logic that has been rotting our communities for decades and instead come together to determine what is valuable for ourselves. We can afford to take on the huge challenges that we face with an idea that is just as big. In fact, with every day, it's getting clearer that we can't afford not to. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you, first of all. If you enjoyed this video, uh, if you're excited by this idea, please chuck it a like, get in the comments section and share it far and wide because ideas like this are accessible and important and powerful. They're just largely unheard of. Let's fix that.